So let's dive into the diet then. Can you cover the calcium to phosphorus ratios for us, please? So when we talk about calcium to phosphorus ratio, so this is something that's known about amongst humans um, and animals, dogs, cats, and in formulating their food. So in a, uh, in a human and in a, a dog or a, a cat, it's generally about, when we say calcium to phosphorus ratio, when it eats a diet, you want to have calcium for a dog or a cat at about 1.2 to 1.4 to calcium to the amount of phosphorus of 1, 1.2 to 1. In reptiles, the generally accepted amount of calcium for phosphorus is 2 to 1. You want twice as much calcium in the diet as your phosphorus. And how they get the calcium? So in something like a snake, when they're eating calcium, it's bones. Um, and then the phosphorus is muscle tissue, meat tissue. So when we talk about calcium and phosphorus, reptiles is two to one. In a rapidly growing reptile, so they found in crocodiles and turtles and tortoises that are rapidly growing, it goes up to you need seven times the amount of calcium to the amount of phosphorus. And they're in the rapidly growing and they have a lot of bone. In the bearded dragons, when they're growing rapidly and we're feeding them a lot, their calcium requirement would go to three to four. Three or four to one, the amount of calcium they would need to phosphorus. And especially people that are feeding them high calorie, um, high calorie, high protein things like, you know, uh, you've got your du dubia roaches, your crickets, that's all high energy. Uh, protein. So these animals are going to be growing and they're usually feeding them what, 15, as much as they can eat in 15 minutes, three times a day. And so when you're putting that much energy into a growing animal, it's going to grow and the amount of calcium requirement will go through the roof. Unfortunately, crickets general, generally the insects that we use for bearded dragons are very high in phosphorus and very low in calcium. So for example, um, Jubia roaches, there was a study and they found the common one that they feed. Um, in some cases it had, it had a calcium phosphorus ratio of one times calcium and 23 times the amount of phosphorus. So it was massively reversed of what it should be. So getting that, and this ties in closely with what we call metabolic bone disease. Metabolic bone disease is multi, could be for multiple reasons. It can be from the amount of vitamin D, not enough heat, um, and um, not enough calcium, but it can also be having from too much phosphorus in the diet because the blood, the blood uh, calcium level needs to be at a ratio with the blood phosphorus level. And if there's a suddenly increase in phosphorus, the blood has to try and get calcium to a certain level and the biggest calcium store in a body is its bones. So it, this body tells it to pull the calcium out of the bones. And that's when you have, you get your bone problems with the metabolic bone disease. So, yeah, so that's pretty much the calcium phosphorus ratio. So based on that, then what are they eating in the wild? So in the wild, so. From the study from Judith Adam, she looked at dragons over a three-year period, juvenile, female, and male, from juvenile to adult, and found that they went from a majority of insects, well, when I say majority, not about 20 to 30% insects as a juvenile, and once they hit reproductive size, they switched over to males having um, an 80% uh, vegetation diet and females having about a 60% vegetation diet. Um, and that was based on dry weight. 
So we do know that vegetation um, is higher in water content. So once you do it to, you convert it to having moisture in it, the amount of leafy greens um, and veggies is a lot higher in terms of weight, live weight. So in the wild, they're eating um, flowers. Um, we've got salvia rabanica, which is um, wild sage they're eating. Um, they do eat um, some wild type hibiscus, uh, native Australian native bluebells, um, flowers, and all of these veg vegetation out there, for example, wild sage has a calcium phosphorus ratio of 22 to 1. 22 times the amount of calcium to phosphorus. So, you know, an animal that's out there, even when it's growing, is still getting large amounts of calcium if it's eating greens out there. And when I say when she did a study of juveniles versus adults, the sexual maturity that she was going off was females at a snout event length of 13 centimetres. 13 to 14 centimetres, and males of 11 snout event length. So we're talking animals which are, you know, 25 centimetres long, you know, less than a, a bit over, um, you know, what, 12 inches? Less than, that's, that's what you call an adult. So, you know, most people's bearded dragons will get that size in like a month or two in captivity if they're feeding them heaps. So, you know, converting them over to that majority vegetation, unless you're a breeding female, is um, ideal to do, you know, as soon as the dra um, your dragon has some any size to it. You know? So it's better to grow those like juveniles much slowly rather than like the, the rapid if growth. You, yeah. If you grow them much slower, the amount of calcium they need to account for the growth is a lot lower. Um, and, you know, in the wild, these dragons aren't reaching sexual maturity. So once again, when I say sexual maturity, snout the vent length of 11 centimetres in males and 14 in females, they're not getting to that size until the second season, the second year of life. Whereas in captivity, they're getting to that size within about two to three months, which is just a massive, you know, this animal isn't designed to grow that fast. I guess it could if you got the nutrition right, but a lot of the time the nutrition isn't right, and that's why we see a lot of problems. See, I think that, I feel a little bit like um, my male was really tiny. He's like a year old and he still looks like a baby. But yeah. I have to remind myself that's what they're meant to look like. Like he is that, he's probably like hit adult sexual. Like yeah. 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 He's so, on the borderline. Yeah. yeah. So with the males will get to at the, the first males that are born, the first clutch, by the end of the first season, they will get to that 11 centimetres just in the wild. But in, um, yeah, in captivity, people are getting them, you know, getting them the full, like, you know, almost full size um, within six months, which is just crazy. Um, and in clinic, I think the earliest, earliest female that we had gravid was an eight month old female, whereas she would not be gravid until she's usually about, you know, 14 months old or something like that. So, so building off of this then, how, often and how much should we be feeding our juvenile bearded dragons? So um, what I usually recommend clients to do is to give them, um, you know, five or six uh, size protein items, cricket, roach, um, the size between their eyes, just as a size wise, give them five to six. Um, and then that volume, you give them um, three times as much vegetables and you have it there, and then you just do that once a day. This is for the first early period when you get them small, and that will they'll grow. They'll grow quite rapidly, and once you get them, because when, when you first get them, they're about 8 grams, 9 grams. Once you get them to about 30 to 40 grams, you can start feeding that every second day and just really slow them down. Um, you know, 
ideally generally slowing them down so that you know it will take them you know at least six months to get to about this big and keep them lean if you start seeing them start getting it's hard because it's like us looking at labradors everyone thinks labradors are meant to be fat and rolly but once you see a working labrador you don't know what type of dog it is because you've never seen something like that before because you society just doesn't know what a normal looking Labrador looks like um, and I feel that society doesn't know what a normal bearded dragon is meant to look like um, so it's really hard but if they come in and it's starting to look fat around the midsection I tell them to stretch it out an extra day for feeding um, just to slow them down because it's it's so hard because of genetics um, it's so hard to go okay you must feed them this much this and then they get to this size um it's all about portion control if you go okay i'm feeding five items of the size between their eyes and then you know three times as much veggies you by weight and then at least if you go okay it's getting fatter okay reduce it to four roaches four crickets and then keep the veggies the same and then you know you keep putting it down or up depending on the way the stomach's going. And this is how, you know, this is a lot more reliable way than going, okay, it must be this way or, you know, you must feed this. Um, and that works for, you know, all species, um, you know, humans, if you want to go there as well. <laughs> if I'm starting to look a bit fat, I just, you know, ease up on my ice cream portion every night. <laughs> um, we've actually prepped the body condition, oh, uh, pictures of our all of our our three bearded dragons for you to look at the body condition so people get a reference later on. But before we go down that route, um, you mentioned obviously saying like three to four like crickets. I just want to specify you mean individual insects and not four boxes of crickets. I just want to just oh, yeah, specify, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Individual. Like they they would get they'd be lucky to get the number of insects that we give them, that people are giving them. Like some of the recommendations of as much as they can eat in 15 minutes for three times a day and people complaining that their, their bearded dragon is costing them a bomb because they've gone through, you know, three or four boxes of crickets in the week and stuff like that. It's just, they don't need to eat that many. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Um, and you know, it's, it's not doing them good. The calcium requirement to get the calcium requirement that they need, those things. So if you're feeding them that many crickets or roaches, you're going to have to be putting that much calcium dust on them to equal out the calcium phosphorus ratio. So you have to be, you know, imagine if you fed them 40 crickets and the cricket is anywhere between 1 to 7 to 1 to 10 calcium phosphorus ratio, but you've got to try and flick that the other way. You're going to have to put volumes of crickets in just calcium, in the weight of calcium even that out to get them to grow properly without any issues, bone issues. So how do juvenile beardies hunt in the wild? Are they cruising around or are they just sitting waiting no. to see a bug? No. So they're usually sitting. Um, so the, where we find them, we find them in bushes. They hold onto the branches in the bushes and, you know, they're deep within the bushes. They're getting scattered light coming into them. Um, usually they're, you know, so they're, they're hidden from predators. Um, and by the time they're born, it's like usually around Christmas time is when their first ones are coming out. And that's quite hot. So they're sitting in a tree, you know, the temperatures are around 35, 40 degrees. So they're getting plenty of heat. Um, and then when an insect runs by, they jump out of the tree, grab it, and then climb back up that tree, well, a bush. It's you know it's a two foot high bush, Three to um, them. <laughs> and that's and that's that's what they're that's how they're they're surviving out there. They they really like to hide in um you know branches and stuff that, that they're well designed for um you know breaking up their patterns. So that's how they they like to live. And then they just jump onto an object or you know if there's any fresh greens coming up, a uh, little herbage, they'll take bites of that as well. So on the flip side, then, how often and how much should we be feeding our adult bearded dragons? So um, adult bearded dragons, we're feeding. So once again, if you can, if you have quite large, like a bearded dragon, a ma large male bearded dragon, his head's pretty big. So, you know, you're talking about 
um, you know, I still go on, you know. So, for example, if I'm feeding a bearded dragon, I tell my clients five, I don't know how to, a large roach. I, I understand Australian woody roaches are quite small compared to some of these American type roaches. I think these American type roaches, you wouldn't want to feed more than three to four twice a week. And then, um, you know, then you'd have about a volume of greens about the size of the bearded dragon's head um, three times a week. So, and then obviously increase or decrease based on their body condition. Hmm. So would you flip that based on how would you change that based on the female being gravid? Would you just increase the portion size? Um, I would I'd add in an extra um, protein size on it. Um, and I would be very careful with um, adding too much protein without the required calcium because a reproductive female, so from our blood tests, there is an increase in calcium in the blood, a four to seven fold increase in the amount of calcium she needs during that time. So that's a lot more calcium. Um, and they use up, they, any animal that lays eggs, it uses a lot of their bone reserves. Um, so ensuring there's enough calcium will allow them to not develop um, any fractures or utilize it uh, to overtax their bones. Um, but yeah, especially calcium dusting and increasing the protein there as well. So, because the proteins required for the albumin and then the calcium on the egg. But also, if you're breeding as a responsible breeder, that calcium, 30% of the calcium is from the shell is used by that hatchling as the form of skeleton. So if you have a female that is not getting enough calcium um, and not laying down enough calcium on that shell, those hatchlings are already predisposed to metabolic bone disease and calcium deficiency straight out of the egg. That's if they make it out of the egg, if there's not enough calcium or vitamin D. So just to, just to flip this a little bit to the side, why do we see so many gastric tumours in bearded dragons? So uh, the neuroendocrine tumours that we're seeing in bearded dragons, it isn't so uh, it has been theorized that it's somewhat genetic due to the small gene pool. But having said that, the increase in detection and increasing numbers is also increasing in Australia from my time there. And it's what I have my own theory on it. Um, we're seeing, you know, this craze to feed bearded dragons so frequently is something that's just happened in the last five to ten years. Prior to this, it wasn't really a problem. Well, in Australia, it wasn't really a problem. We didn't generally get these obese animals. In We know in humans, increases in the type 1 um, neuroendocrine gastric tumours, so it is increases um, when there's uh, an excess of gastric acid. These animals that we're feeding constantly have got constant gastric acid secretion in their stomachs. And they're just not designed to have a stomach full of food and gastric acid all the time. That's irritating the intestinal, uh, the gastric lining. So these gastric cells they have to keep dividing and keep multiplying that deal with this increase of gastric acid. Every time a cell divides, it increases the chance of a tumour just because it's got to replicate all the DNA. So we're feeding these animals so much more. They're getting exposed to increased gastric acid all the time. So these stomach cells have to keep dividing and that increases the chance of their tumour. And this is why I think we're seeing an increase in these gastric neuroendocrine tumors, um, because the gas, the 
the gastric cells are just exposed to so much acid and have to keep multiplying and multiply so much that that's what a tumor is, an uncontrolled growth of a cell, which these neuroendocrine tumors are. But, you know, it's something that, you know, it has, it's getting a lot more attention in the veterinary field. So hopefully we can get to the bottom of it and find out why this is happening. So based on all of this, you're saying like how much you feed them and all these gastric tumors, and feeding them less. What are your thoughts on the bowls of meal ones people leave in for like Beer the Dragons constantly? Yeah. Ad lib. No, I like my McDonald's too. Um, it's just pretty much McDonald's for them. Um, unlimited McDonald's um, meal worms are just, just high in fat, high in phosphorus, um, you know, just not the best. Um, you know, it's good to have variety, um, just like us. Um, but you know, a mealworm, you know, a couple of mealworms every month is fine. But you know, you get a lot of, you hear a lot of stories of people's dragons not wanting to eat anything else. Um, it's because one, they don't need to eat once they're overweight. And two, when you're feeding them McDonald's, if you give them healthy food, they're just going to go, well, no, I don't want to eat something bland. I want to eat something. And that's, you know, that's a natural thing. Humans, dogs, everything, you give them something high in fat value because fat helps them survive through hard times. So yeah, it's not, not something you want, you want to do. Um, yeah, you don't, but at the same time, you don't want to feed them heaps of just crickets or heaps of just roaches. You just want to give a variety, cover all your, uh, amino acids, minerals and everything like that. Should we be feeding fruit? No. 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 Um, so there was a study out on dental disease and the increase in dental disease was due to feeding fruit. That was one of the factors that highly influenced it. Um, but also they, they don't eat fruit out in the wild. We don't. What they're eating is mainly green veggies, um, herbage and, and insects. Um, you know, Arid Australia doesn't have any of these like sweet fruits. People aren't feeding them. They're not, there's no strawberries growing out there. There's like, you know, it's just not stuff with that sugar content isn't out there. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's just not something that's natural for them. And in the veterinary literature has been shown to pre, uh, predispose them to, um, dental disease. And then also there is somewhat, um, you know, if you look at a lot of, uh, fungal cultures, uh, as well, it increases the fungal culture um, of the gut. So, um, you know, it's, is it going to get to an area where it's bad for them? The fungus levels, um, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, this is something that I work with every day at the moment. Um, and it, in an animal production world, yeah, it, reduces feed efficiency there's increased number of fungus in the gut but you know nothing that we're concerned about with a pet animal so right right so stop feeding fruit um so what are your thoughts then on needing there's such a, a amount of calcium when they're growing and if people are feeding lots or if they've got a gravid female who has a really high need of calcium what are your thoughts on ha giving like just pure ca in a bowl like ad lib style for them to self-regulate from one whether they're going to self-regulate until they get to the point where they're so deficient that they start performing pica and want to eat the substrate slash the calcium um but you know when we we as humans tend to have a look at these things as an individual thing, calcium, phosphorus. But what about the amino acids and the proteins and all that stuff that all need to come together as a whole? That That's where we need to look at it. You know, we always look at things like, you know, you've got people saying, oh, don't feed spinach, don't feed um, kale. You know, it's this singular thing that's evil. But realistically, you know, you need to consider everything as a whole and how it interacts with each other. So I think, you know, 
solving the problem by just giving them just this is not a problem. Just giving them calcium is not going to solve the fact they don't get UV or this. Everything, the human body, the animal's body is all a network of interconnected things and we just need to balance it really and do it as it would. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to solve our problem, you know, having it there or even, you know, giving them oral doses of calcium or the, um, calcium liquid or anything like that. That's not the way to solve the problem. It's to think of it as a balance and give them everything um, as a balance, increased as a balance. So what supplements should people use? Because what I do is I, I take like a pure CA and I'll take like the Earth Pro A from Arcadia. It's got like everything in it is over like a, a preform to something else or like... um like carotenoids to vitamin a yep. or it's like water soluble and i yep. basically feed that every single time I, I feed like uh protein and then i'll do like a multivitamin like once a week like the synthetic like like a bit yep. more potent ones once a week so what do you think of that routine generally i say just because of the variety of um protein insects that we have none of them are really what we would call suitable and despite i'm guilty of this myself even though me preaching oh yeah you should feed 80 percent veggies that never happens that way so every time i feed a protein source an insect i will dust it with calcium um because you know it doesn't like i think the only one really that is insect that's really good there's certain spiders that are good for um, and certain flies that are good for calcium phosphorus ratio, but, um, your soldier fly larvae, um, black soldier fly larvae are, are good calcium phosphorus ratio. But even then it's their exoskeleton that holds most of the calcium and that's indigestible. The bearded dragon. So are they getting that calcium? So, um, I say dust every insect every time you feed it. Um, I don't worry but with calcium. Um, and then I give, uh, multivitamin, um, you know, when a bearded dragon, adult bearded dragon's eating three times a week, I say, uh, every two weeks, feed it a multivitamin with vitamin D in it. I'm not quite sure, you know, you know, if you've got proper UV, it's not really useful, but just to have it there, it's not going to hurt it. You're not going to overdose it. Um, and yeah, so multivitamin every two weeks, um, calcium every protein feed. That's what my recommendation is. Um, is it based off, you know, hard and fast nutrition and science? Um, the calcium for the insects is the multivitamin. We know that, you know, if you're feeding a varied diet, you're going to get most of the vitamins there. And we're just looking at those ones that might be deficient just to make sure that it's in there. But, you know, one thing that I did take from my nutrition lectures at, um, university is that uh a lot of the stuff that is developed um is a, is almost going too far um, in terms of what the vitamins is if you have a balanced diet you don't really need it that much and it's just to pick up anything that just might not be out and you know water-based um vitamins no risk of overdosing but you know you've got your fat fat-based ones there is a risk of build up and you know, we don't want to overdo it so. so we're using it like sparingly just as like a safety net to come back in on underneath to like just if anything's missing to just yeah, that to up. catch anything that's yeah missing yeah but there is um you know not so much in bearded dragons but um in tortoises um there are cases of you know problems if you overdose with certain vitamins they're very prone to overdosing some tortoises and um from um you know, what you see with chameleons, them as well, if you overdose with them, they'll have problems as well. So, I mean, I think I know what your answer is going to be anyway, but what are your thoughts on the commercial diets for bearded dragons that have come out? So, there are benefits in that a commercial diet can add the calcium phosphorus ratio, all the vitamins and everything in a proper balance, and that's good. 
So it doesn't matter whether you're feeding them. Um, if you kept them purely on it, if you're feeding them a lot of it or a little of it, it's going to be balanced when it goes in. But the downfall is who knows what balanced is. There is, I looked at it, I was actually two years ago, three years ago, I went through every commercial diet and started listing the amount of pr uh, protein in it, fat, sugar, all the vitamins. And the amount of protein varied from like 13% to 45%. It was just like, who's developing these? Like, you know, um, developing proper nutrition is hard. It's very hard. Um, when they were doing dogs back in the eighties and stuff like that, they did it and they got it wrong and they found out and it's taken this long to get a commercial diet for dogs. And most of them are good. Um, you know, a good quality, but. You know, no one's putting money into bearded dragons. It's not you know, yet. <laughs> not yet. Um, yeah, and it's it's hard. Animal nutrition is hard. You increase one thing, and it interacts with something else, and you get a drop in that. Or, you know, there's got going to be problems, and you know, it's 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 hard. So I can't. There is no diet I can recommend. Um, but there are benefits if you could get there something good at the end just because everything will be balanced and you don't have the risk of, of metabolic bone disease calcium phosphorus ratio things and stuff like that so but for now um i think we go off what we know works um with the live food and stuff like that and the greens and know what something what they have in the wild even though you know that bok choy you're getting from the chinese supermarket represents nothing that you know it's nothing like the, the, the low nutrition herbage out there you know so yeah but it's if if we can you know the main factors the main problems are the calcium phosphorus ratio and that the excess excess proteins that's it really what are your thoughts on like weed picking because we might our tactic is we use like apps like the tortoise table to see if it's green for tortoises is normally or along those baselines is probably all right for beard dragons so we'll pick like dandelions and things that we'll use apps to make sure that if the tortoise table is like yeah this this plant is like a bog standard green staple for a tortoise diet normally it's all right for beard dragons what are your thoughts on that tactic yeah normally it's all it's all right like even plants that we've that have been documented that bearded dragons eat on the, in the wild in Australia, we know are toxic to things like, um, horses and cattle and stuff like that. Um, you know, so we know they have a tolerance of some toxins. Um, but generally if it's safe for the tortoises, um, you know, one, the guts are a lot more simple, but, um, than it's, than a tortoise, but, you know, generally they're going to, um, it's going to be safe for a bearded dragon in all case. And, you know, going out and picking it, it's not, not going to be a problem. So. The clip you've just watched is just a snippet of a larger podcast episode where we had bearded bear on the podcast. If you want to find the full podcast episode, you can find that up here. Or if you want to carry on looking through the bearded bear Explained series, you can find the rest of it down here.